Durema. We're going to analyze that article, go through it uh, for the first part of class. We'll end that part with a YouTube video that's about eight minutes long. That's also time when you can take a break and well, that'll be the end of the first part of class. And then the second part of class, we're going to go back into the textbook, back into the Mucklin Gonzalez, uh, the end of chapter one. And we're going to look at the history, uh, a sort of very brief version of the history of anthropology. Uh, not so much because I want you to know the history of anthropology, but because of what it meant to the development of uh, our ideas about how humans behave and who humans are uh, in the United States. It was actually uh, important to our ideas about uh, race and culture uh, from early on. So we'll go briefly into the, that history of anthropology. Well, that's something we'll review uh, in the middle of the semester when we start talking in depth in chapter eight about the culture concept. So this is just kind of a, a preview of that now, but it's just important for you to understand where anthropology comes in into the, the larger framework. So uh, at the end of that, we're then going to wrap back and conclude with the Naki Rema again. So the Naki Rema will kind of frame our class. Uh, we'll start out by analyzing it, then we'll go into the history of anthropology, and then at the very end, we'll wrap back to it. Uh, I apologize, I actually pronounced the Naki Rema incorrectly last time. Um, some people do say Nasi Rehma, sometimes I do say it that way, but I noticed when I was looking at the Google YouTube subtitles, that is not the greatest uh, pronunciation for the subtitle. So we'll go with the official Naki Rehma pronunciation and hope the subtitles work for us. This is a classic article in the sense that it's been around for a long time and is uh, very widely known, uh, especially within uh, Intro to Anthropology classes. So it was written in 1956 by Horace Minor and probably has been read by thousands, hundreds of thousands, maybe of anthropology students. I've probably assigned it to maybe not thousands, but at least hundreds of anthropology students myself. It's also often read uh, outside of anthropology. So sometimes uh, people read it in other classes uh, and they come into this class and they, they've already read it before. So one of the things I do uh, that is kind of mean or cruel when I'm in the class is I actually make the people who have read it before in another context, they kind of have to be quiet for a while while I talk to the students who have never read it and we just sort of draw out sort of what are the strangest, weirdest things about the Naki Rama. And so I kind of tried to do that with the discussion board. I asked you what you thought was the strangest thing about the Naki Rama. But then I asked, well, if you thought about 1950s United States, in the context of that, would it be that strange or were there things that might be parallel to that? So I got some great answers there. Um, one of you was very interested in the, the shrines, thought that was very strange, these places where they go individually and each house has one of them and they sort of don't like to show uh, what they're doing, their bodily functions, so they'll shut themselves up in these shrines and there's these uh, potion boxes and stuff and powders and things that they may have even forgotten what they're used for, but they, you know, they do all these things. That's where they also do the, the mouth right, the daily mouth right, where they have that bundle of hogs hairs that they swirl about in their mouth to try and get things kind of clean. Uh, they also scrape their faces in there. Uh, so these are, you know, one of you thought this, this was uh, pretty strange. Going along with the mouth rituals, uh, several of you noticed the holy mouth men or the holy mouth man where the Naki Rain will go once or twice a year. Uh, they use Holy mouth men poke and prod the mouths of the Naki Rama. They seem to have, take almost sadistic pleasure in, uh, in inflicting pain on the, the poor Naki Rama mouths. And they keep going back even though their teeth seem to uh, decay over time. So very uh, concerned with the mouth, uh, very concerned with, uh, with the, the emotions that it expresses as well. Um, the Latipso, another kind of strange place where people go when they are ill. Um, there's a sort of whole rites around that as well. Uh, it doesn't seem to always cure people. And in fact, uh, they, they seem to 
go there even though that doesn't necessarily make them better and it can uh, cost them quite dearly in terms of a financial outlay. So uh, let tip so. Um, actually, none, none of you talked about this, but this is always uh, of interest to me that uh, there are these places that are where the women go and kind of bake their heads in an oven for about an hour. So definitely a very strange thing. Um, several of you, I was happy to see, got pretty deep into the article and talked about how strange you thought it was about the, the listeners or the listener. Uh, a person that the Naki Rama go to to discuss their problems and will will talk on and on about going back into their childhood and you know the Naki Rama often believe that the parents bewitch their own children and that the, especially the mothers are involved in this bewitching and so the, the listener is someone who they go to to talk about uh, their problems and to try and get get those problems taken care of. Uh, one of you talked about uh, one side of their fascination with the body, which is sort of hiding pregnancy and being very concerned about, about modesty and very conservative about their bodies. But then there's the other side of that, which is on uh, page 506, where they talk about, uh, you know, some people being paraded around. So there's this great sentence at the bottom of the uh, Bottom of 506, there are ritual fasts to make fat people thin and ceremonial feasts to make thin people fat. Still other rites are used to make women's breasts larger if they are small and smaller if they are large. Um, a few women afflicted with almost inhuman hypermemory development are so idolized that they make a handsome living by simply going from village to village and permitting the natives to stare at them for a fee. So uh, yeah, this is uh, this sort of weird, uh, weird relationship with the body where on the one hand, it's, uh, they're, um, they're very conservative about it, but on the other hand, uh, they, will, uh, they will not want that, uh, will, will expose themselves uh, for a fee at, at certain times. So then I asked, you know, are there any parallels to what, uh, what happens with uh, U.S. Americans? And, um, and again, I'm trying to, to sort of think about this in the context of 1956. So, um, one of you said, well, you know, I mean, are the things that people do in those shrines that different than, you know, what most people would consider are things that we do when we go into the bathroom? And, you know, we might even remember that the uh, toothbrushes back in, you know, the 19, at least, you know, in the 1950s, they were starting to change the form of the toothbrush, but they actually did use uh, hog's hairs in, in certain toothbrushes, uh, even in our own society. So that was kind of, a, uh, you know, I mean, now they're mostly made from synthetic materials, but uh, back in the day, uh, that might not have been so unfamiliar. And then one of you talked about, well, the handwriting, or I mean, the, the, it's impossible to read the script, uh, as they say, as uh, Miner says uh, here on uh, how, um, prescriptions, uh, the, this is on page 504, this writing is understood only by the medicine men and by the herbalists who, for another gift, provide the required charm. And I guess I'd say, well, you know, in the old days, it was said that the doctor's handwriting was completely indecipherable and they'd hand it off to someone who was a pharmacist or a, a nurse and they'd be the only ones who could make sense of the handwriting and could, you know, get you whatever you needed for as a prescription. So, you know, I mean, now their doctors are supposed to be all computerized and can send your script straight to the pharmacy. But in the old days, there was this, there was this handoff ritual there. One of you mentioned that, hey, maybe that holy mouth men is kind of like we go to the dentist once or twice a year, but of course we're, we're thinking that we're gonna get our teeth repaired and we're not gonna get worse. And I started to think about this in terms of the pandemic. I haven't been able even to go to the dentist, scared to go to the dentist, and boy, when I get there, I am sure they are going to poke and prod my mouth and you know, take some sadistic pleasure and they're gonna admonish me that I need to clean up here and there and floss and poke around and do all those weird things that dentists do in your mouth, even though my teeth seem to just keep deteriorating. I keep going back. 
Again, we expect to get better in the hospital. Of course, sadly, in the last year or so, we've learned that that's not a place you want to be. So I'll just uh, I'll concentrate on that. Uh, back in the 1950s, women used to go to those hair salons. I don't know if you've seen those movies where they put those things over their heads and they would get all hot and, you know, their hairs would literally almost bake in there. I wonder what uh, Horace Minor would say if he could see us going down to the tanning salon and baking our whole bodies in these sun lamps and things, which seems a little bit odd, perhaps even odder than those uh, 1950s headlamps. Um, one of you mentioned that, you know, in the 1950s, there was a huge stigma against mental health and mental health issues. Um, I would also say that, you know, in the 1950s, uh, the only sort of cure, you might say, for people who are having mental health issues was to go into what they called psychoanalysis. And so you'd go and see a, a therapist maybe once a week and describe your issues. At the time, there were some uh, Freudian ideas about, you know, how your parents were responsible for a lot of your problems, especially your mom. And, you know, they'd talk about different kinds of complexes. And so, you know, you work that out over a long time with your therapist. Um, in these days, we believe that, in fact, if we're having troubles, we can be cured with a different kind of potion, with, you know, an antidepressant pill, and those have come out in the last 10 or 20 years, uh, now we believe that that will help us do that. Oh, yes. Well, I know in the 1950s that, you know, there were some people who used to go to places and they'd pay a fee to watch other people undress. Um, I guess, I don't think we, I don't think anybody would ever do that in these days, but, you know, uh, times certainly have changed. All right, so at this point in the class, usually hopefully somebody is smiling because they're starting to tune into what's going on or I let somebody who's already read the article give the game away. But in fact, Horace Minor here is putting one on us. He is actually writing about American society in the 1950s, the things that he describes are, are things that he is imagining an anthropologist coming from the outside would might be able to describe the people as he's playing with a typical sort of anthropological language of the time. So indeed, it is not a co coincidence that Nakirema is American spelled backward because that is exactly what Horace Minor is trying to do. It is not a coincidence that the Latipso is hospital spelled backward. That's what he's trying to do. There are a few clues that on the very first page of this, on page 503, he talks about how they are a North American group living in the territory between the Canadian Cree and the so-and-so of Mexico. So somewhere in North America between Canada and Mexico, that's where we are. And then they have the cultural hero, Nok Ding Sha, who is, of course, Washington throwing something over the Potomac and chopping down a cherry tree. They have a highly developed market economy, uh, et cetera. So he is trying to play with us. And, and in fact, uh, that will be on the exam. So just remember, Nagi Rema are actually Americans. It's a satire of anthropology, a satire of our own society and those kinds of things. Why do we still assign it? And I would say that the Naki Rayman in some ways has enduring relevance, even though it was written in 1956 and describes a society that has changed in many ways. In some ways, we are more like the Naki Rayma than perhaps we know. So Miner in this article talks a lot about how people believe, how they have to believe in the kinds of the potions that they are receiving. Um, and a lot of medical studies have confirmed that belief, the belief that what a, the doctor is doing, that white coat, that potion, the ritual around it is extremely important for how we're going to feel, if we're going to feel that we're going to get better or not. 
Um, even things like, you know, the fact that people believe that antidepressants will work, we can actually sometimes give people placebos, what's called the placebo effect, and we say, well, this is an antidepressant. It's a sugar pill, but it actually has a similar effect. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, there's no medical efficacy to these things, but belief is hugely important for how uh, we uh, respond to various things uh, as, you know, on the statistical whole. I also think that it's, you know, when Miner talks about the general dissatisfaction with, uh, with body shape, uh, he talked about how the ideal female body form was virtually outside the range of human variation. And, you know, this is kind of uh, literally true when it came to sort of the ideal of the time, the, the famous Barbies, there were Barbie dolls that were being produced. If you, if you made a Barbie life-size, if you took the plastic Barbie and made it life-size, it would not be able to fit the normal uh, female anatomy. And so, you know, it was in fact the case that our ideal or, you know, the ideal that some people had placed upon uh, female bodies was simply completely unattainable. It was not, it was not inside the range of human variation. Now, I think that this is also extended to males as well. And for those of you who are trying to go to the gym and, well, if you can go to the gym and get that, you know, that, that six pack of abs. And, you know, I mean, I think that in some ways, this is even more extended of our body woes and our body uh, image ideas is now something that a lot of men have uh, internalized or externalized as well. So what, what is Miner trying to say here, right? He is trying to uh, help us deal with our own ethnocentrism, with our own ideas that what we do is the natural right thing to do, the, the, the only way to be human, and to make us see that, you know, from an outside perspective, what we do might be strange as well. And so he wants us to sort of examine our own society, as we talked about in the last class, that cultural relativism is also critical self-awareness, and that instead of being ethnocentric, that we will look at ourselves and at other societies with different kinds of eyes, with the eye of cultural relativism. Now, as we talked about in the last class, that doesn't mean that we're going to go full on moral relativism or philosophical relativism. Remember that this is not necessarily accepting what every society does. And in fact, we can be very critical of our own society and we can even be critical of other societies for some of their practices, as long as we first attempt to understand them from within their own context and why they make, may make sense uh, to us from there. So, interestingly, uh, the Nakirema has uh, has spawned a kind of uh, subgenre on YouTube. I'm going to show you uh, one of those videos that kind of uh, goes through, uh, covers the article and then the, the surprise of it in a, in a similar way to what our class does. But there are others. If you Google the Naki Rama on YouTube, you'll find uh, several people who've done this as kind of a, 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 a fun genre of poking fun at our own society. And uh, one of the things that, I mean, you should never, of course, you read the comments on YouTube, but sometimes I, uh, when I'm looking at these, I scrolled into the comments and somebody had said that, hey, this video sucks. I'm looking for information on the tribe. What's going on here, you know? And so there's this funny thing where they actually thought there were this tribal Naki Rama and this video was being uh, obnoxious about that. So I'm gonna uh, show that. That's gonna go on for about eight minutes. We can, 